session, we will explore the theme uh, advocating constructive shareholder engagement and long-term value max maximization. Um, I think the panel members represented here uh, represent a good mix that I believe will set the stage for a lively and entertaining debate. Uh, it is rather unfortunate that Mr. LeBroy can't be with us, uh, but you know we have with us Mr. David and Jama, who have been introduced to both of you, or to all of you. And also with us is someone who is no stranger to this sector of uh, corporate governance. Uh, it's Ms. Rita Bernabouchon. Rita was appointed as the Chief Executive of Officer of Minority Shareholder Watchdog Group in January 2009. And as his director on, in May 2009, she's currently a member of the at Standards Boards of Malaysian Institute of Accountants. Uh, she's also served with the, in the EPF for 23 years since 1984. For today's session, which is the last uh, for the first day, uh, we have set some broad issues to guide our panelists in their presentations. They include should companies view the rising decibels in the tone of, and voices of investors as a threat or opportunity. Um, there's also encouraging proactive communication between the board of directors and shareholders, and focusing on stakeholders across the value chain and not just on shareholders. But I would appreciate also if, uh, is, uh, if our panelists can share views on some other critical issues that we in journalism are exploring. Among them include, how do we overcome this culture, uh, or rather this cultural obstacle of voicing constructive criticisms, especially in an environment where government-owned uh, corporations dominate the corporate landscape. And because some of the biggest shareholders are like EPF and Quark, can we really expect the re their representatives to be independent? And like David pointed out earlier, you know, what kind of agenda do they bring into the table? A lot of companies, we also know, there are controversies. A lot of companies do, do things with disregard of, to minority shareholders. The issue of Saim Darby's purchase of a strategic block in ENO remains a blister whenever we discuss corporate governance in Malaysia. So these are issues I would like maybe for our panelists to touch on. Finally, I would like to hear also from the watch maybe from Rita, on whether there more needs to be done to educate the retail side and empower them to be more vocal. And with that, on this note, I would like to maybe call on Rita to give her presentation. Uh, I would also suggest that we stick to about 10 minutes each and we can take questions and answers after that. Thank you. Uh, no. Globe, I like to put this in context uh, as regards responsible ownership as what um, our chairman mentioned earlier as regards the EPFs and the institutional shareholders that needs to take a very important role to play in the, uh, in, in the stewardship codes. Um, in this sense, I would like to bring about uh, what we are doing now in the uh, in, in um, international Corporate Governance uh, Network, which is a global organization of about 130, I mean, 163 trillion dollars of investments, uh, where I'm a chair of this of a co-chair of the Shareholders Responsibility Committee, and we are advocating responsible ownership uh, in terms of stewardship codes, true stewardship codes, uh, stating that. Um, I like to talk about this in the context of the global shareholder uprising right now that is occurring uh, 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 in many parts of the world. Now, we talk about the responsible ownership. I'd just like to bring in um, you know, where the CG code identifies the principles that underlies an effective board. I like to talk about responsible ownership, responsibility of stewardship is a shared responsibility, and the primary responsibility of 
uh, stewardship is with the board. Is with the board uh, to ensure that they can look into management practices. And the responsibility of invest investors to play a very important role in holding the board to account. So it's a dual role. And CG code, the CG corporate governance code identifies that you know uh, the principles underlying good practices in corporate governance of an effective board as stated earlier, independent directors and all their uh, practices. Whereas stewardship code sets up principle of effective stewardship by investors. So it's different. The corporate governance code and then the stewardship code. In the code, it of course talks about engagement. One of the very important principles in a stewardship code is about engagement. Uh, apart from engagement, it is a responsible ownership uh, in terms of looking at the invest in, uh, at investing companies to ensure the investing companies are governed effectively. They have to look into performance, corporate governance, risks, and many other uh, good practices uh, that the institution, or, or I would say the stewardship code, which is very much focused on institutional investors to look into, because they have the might of the shares to ensure that uh, uh, proper uh, practices are adhered to. Now, the OECD too uh, talks about this uh, 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 issue of engagement, which is a very important ownership respons responsible ownership uh, element. The ICGN2, we are looking at this uh, specific uh, issue. And uh, the corporate governance blueprint, which I must say that I was quite uh, involved in, uh, we talked about the responsible ownership uh, element. Now, talking about that, I'd just like to talk about, like, you know, um, I put there uh, black rocks and, and, and even EPF there. Because in, in the local context, I think the EPF is the only one that came up with a, a, a certain... Uh, um, level of certain guidance, oh, they, they, they came up with voting guidelines and made it public, which is a very important element of stewardship code. Now, seeing that, um, global rise of investors' voice, I just want to bring up issues that occurred. Uh, we call it shareholder spring. Okay, um, and it is uh, uh, not a, I hope this is not a one-time kind of affair that occurs. It's mostly on remuneration and the fat salaries of executives. But I believe that this was a message that, uh, that you know, um, like Abiva's um, uh, Andrew was taken, had to resign because of issues regarding, um, he give, he, he, I mean, he was uh, getting good salaries at the expense of shareholders giving dividends which is very low or no, no dividend performance. Similarly, Barclays, uh, Bob Diamond, he did not, of course, uh, it was more than just his the fat salaries that was given to him and the tax element that was even given by the company to him as regards the compensation that was given and yet he brought the company to a very uh, low level of, uh, while he, on, in his stewardship, that, you know, uh, issues such as the LIBOR rates occurred. Uh, even the comp uh, remuneration chairman was voted against, at, but he, he was not taken out, but 27% of shareholders voted against the remuneration chairman because she agreed to certain uh, pay payment of compensation to Bob. Um, stating that, uh, I'd like to bring about the MSWG itself, we have come up with a lot of forums on retail investors uh, on issues that we believe was very important to, uh, to, to tell the companies uh, that, that, you know, that certain things ought to be given. For instance, privatization. Uh, we did, uh, we, we called up on, re so therefore, I mean, we called up on shareholders these are retail shareholders who own a, you know, a certain percentage and above, or even um, mom and pops, who came to become a collective voice. Uh, you know, what, what, um, 
the chairman was mentioning on retail uh, investors. We did this and we had outcomes that were, I think, very positive. Outcomes which ensure that at least um, certain uh, element of um, um, pricing was given back you know, uh, to retail investors. And this was not only one, one or two, but quite a few, which was never made known in the press. And, but the only one that was made in, in the press was something that, you know, uh, I, I, I mean, is the country heights. Uh, but there were other uh, forums that we had had, and we had similar good um, effects. Of course, it's very far and few between. We hope that actually the, the, the institutional investors having certain uh, shareholding, maybe even 1% or 2%, they could come. But it really, uh, we see an absence of institutional investors in such forums. Uh, and I hope that you know, uh, such forums can in uh, or at least institutional investors can come and you know, make their say as well. Um, and, and together with the minority shareholders, because institutional shareholders are minority shareholders, they should come together with the retail investors to, uh, to, to, to have a desired outcome. Um, now, I'd like to talk about, uh, very quickly uh, about this communication between board and investors. Okay, I just want to say here is... Um, there are many ways of, 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 you know, of communication process. You have engagement via the letters to uh, shareholders. I mean, this is between board and investors. So, you know, in many of instances, we have, uh, we have experienced that. Uh, sad to say, the companies do not, um, are not forthcoming in, in meeting up with investors, except analyst briefing. And the people who hate, um, you know, they delegate this responsibility to uh, really the IRs and the legal, legal councils, which is not sufficient because, you know, shareholders want a certain level of comfort. And, and we, we, we want to see the um, chairperson or the senior independent directors and the CEO as well if they need to have the IRs and IR directors and so on to be together. But really, this has occurred quite a number of, uh, of um, in, in world over, except that in UK, I must say, the chairman and the senior independent directors make themselves available to shareholders, at least the top 10 shareholders. And they have also a forum for retail investors, and sometimes they, they meet up on a continuous basis, because when you meet up on a continuous basis, you will have goodwill with your shareholders. Having this goodwill will bring you a long way in terms of support during turbulent times. Um, so, uh, just but, but just to let I mean to to also be fair to the uh, to the to the companies in Malaysia, I must say that. When I do, I have done a lot of engagements with companies, engagement not under AGM, engagements, the highest authority of the board will be there. So we have gone a long way in that sense, compared to when I was in the EPF a long time ago where we did have engagements, you don't see the, 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 the chairpersons or you know, the board of directors present. You only see normally, okay, the CEO can be there, but sometimes it's most of the speaking is done by the IRs. So these are things that I can see a real shift in terms of behavior. Um, uh, in, 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 uh, okay, um, other than the engagement process in, in, in the normal formal method, you, got, you have informal engagements where you meet in terms of in, you know, in, 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 in social functions. You can also, of course, these are things that of course, you must, the board must be aware of the insider trading in issues, that you cannot give material information to one set of, uh, of, of group. You must ensure that when you do give that kind of material information, it has to be uh, announced, uh, you know, so that everyone gets equal level of information. Um, now, uh, you can also, of course, the, the communication process could also be through AGMs and EGMs, which I must say that also in AGMs and EGMs of the last few years that I have been, it was a very, very 
positive, I would say very positive AGMs and EGMs in terms of the companies, uh, the, the highest level of the company, the chairperson and the CEO will bring up issues, will uh, explain to the uh, shareholders about their company's prospects or at least the company's uh, operations um, and, 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 and answer questions which are pertinent. Uh, now, the culture, I just want to talk about a bit of the culture. Uh, I want to say that actually the culture is to be built, it, it cannot develop overnight. It takes, you know, it evolves. And every part of the ecosystem of the corporate governance needs to play their role. The shareholders have to play their role in terms of exercising ownership rights. The board ensuring the policies are there in terms of engagement processes, participation at AGMs. The management must make sure that they are, um, you know, they, they, they open the commun communication channels to, um, to certain other, uh, you know, um, uh, stakeholders. Um, now, CG is, a, as I mentioned, CG is a shared responsibilities, responsibility and uh, a CG culture that is underpinned by transparent disclosure, effective communication and constructive engagement between all of these parties will put companies and shareholders more at, in sync towards better governance and sustainable long-term value. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rita. Um, it's it's heartening to note that, you know, that seeds have been sown on minority uh, shareholder activism, but clearly more needs to be done. And also it's good that companies are starting to take it seriously. But clearly there seems to be some lack of uh, institutional investor activism that we need to, to step up. Maybe this can be, you know, explored further in questions after our two other speakers. At this point in time, I'd like to invite Mr. Jama from Samizha to share with us. Hello. This is going to be tough. I, I see uh, the afternoon is really taking its toll. Maybe I should ask a question uh, first. How many of you in the room think you are a retail investor? Do you know what a retail investor is? That's when you have a broker account and you pick the shares you're going to buy on Bursa Saham. So how many of you are retail investors? Now we see a few hands, right? Yeah. So that's a retail investor. How many of you think you are uh, a majority shareholder or an institutional investor? How many of you think you are? One. How many of you are Malaysians? Most of you. So you contribute to the EPF, no? Right? So you are part of an institutional investor, right? Now, do you know what EPF is doing with your money? Right? No? Yes? Are you questioning EPF? If you're not, just like Rita said, you're not being a responsible owner of a business that EPF may or may not be investing in, may, might be investing in. You are part of an institu institutional investor. So, these are things that I think uh, you may or may not realize, um, but if you really sit back and look, you know that you play a bigger role than you should be doing, right? Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is, in terms, and that relates to shareholder engagement, which is the topic of this. Uh, so, there we have in this room, people either are forced to come to this summit, or who are interested to be part of this summit have missed a point. <laughs> Being a responsible owner and then engaging as a shareholder. Now, if you're sitting on the board of directors of a company or if you're a management of a company, this is when it gets challenging, right? Uh, a while back, I was privileged enough to be the director of communications of Slumberger Limited. At the time, I thought it was a job about, you know, communicating, I don't know what, magazines or something, or just a PR job. Uh, and then I quickly realized that we, in Slumberger Limited, we have two directors of communications. 
uh, I was the one responsible for internal and customers. That means the management communication to employees. We have 130,000 employees at that time. We have 110 now. Uh, and then also we communicate to customers via publications, via trade shows, via uh, customer road shows. So this was my job. The other chap, his official title was Director of Corporate Communications. So he had to communicate to shareholders. He had to communicate to uh, NGOs and governmental organizations. Now, but both of us, in reality, we were really playing each other's job. We were like backups of one another. And one of the first things I, we had to do was an investor event, right? And when you go to this, when you organize such an investor event, it is actually an engagement of the top management of the company to the shareholders. And this is different to an AGM, uh, you know, one of those annual general meetings of shareholders. And then you realize investors or shareholders are not homogenous. They're not the same. First of all, institutional investors, you have the buy side or what they call the sell side. So there is some institution interested only in the business of selling your shares, somehow getting public money to trade and sell your shares. And then the other side, the intent is to buy because they have a long-term view of the company, right? Uh, so that's the first issue. The second issue is some are so big, like Rita said, some are small, which is why organizations like the one Rita represent is key. These are retail, retail investors or small shareholders with minority interests that needs a voice. Um, so I think, in summary, after doing that job and what I've learned is that shareholder or ownership engagement is, is important. In fact, it's central to corporate governance, which is the the whole topic of this summit uh, these next uh, couple of days. But um, the question is, who is responsible? Is it the board of directors? I don't think so. That's just my opinion, mainly because I was in that communications job. And the reason is because a bit like what uh, Mr. Barry uh, mentioned in the previous uh, session, which is the management is the one that's engaged in the business and the corporation 365 days a, a year. So they know a lot more and they can answer a lot more questions. Therefore, if it's the management res uh, responsibility for communication and engagement with shareholders, what, does the, what role does the board play? Because the board also, one way or another, have to be engaged. So I think the, uh, the suggestion would be that management determines what can and cannot be said, maybe. Board of directors checks that these are transparent enough and reasonable. Bearing in mind you have short-term you know, shareholders who only want to make money in a quick, uh, in a quick way uh, and, and a lot of shareholders who are thinking the long term, a la EPF, right? Uh, some are big and some are small. So bearing all of that in mind, between the board of directors and the management, they decide who communicates what, who can say up to what point and who can engage how often. I think uh, that's all really I have to say about shareholder engagement. Uh, thank you, Jamal. I mean, thank you for your provocative comments that we as Malaysians generally need to take a hard look at ourselves uh, and how we need to play a more direct role with, um, with all the money that's being invested because a lot of it is really our money too. And this question about who's responsible for communicating with shareholders, uh, whether the kind of roles management and the board should play. I think are also good questions that we can explore because there are no single answer, uh, single answers to all of this. And at, on that note, I would like to ask Mrs. Barry now to share with us his thoughts, and we can take questions after that. Thank you, Leslie. Um, as I went through this, I thought there were two interesting words. One was constructive which to me means about listening, evaluating, and responding. And the other one was proactive, which means it's driven by inquiry. Um, I think it's possible for a board to be proactive. Um, I think it's easier for management to be, um, uh, uh, to be constructive. Um, and I think we have, to, we have to be very careful about the roles that need to be played here, particularly in relationship between the company and the shareholders. Now, management and the board are part of the company. The shareholders are often seen as being separate, but they're not. There's actually a triangle. 
and the arrows go both ways, all the way around this, this triangle. It is looking again at the roles that need to, um, uh, that need to, be, um, uh, need to be played. On balance, I think that most companies in, in Malaysia and globally are beginning to disclose a lot better. Um, it's something that's being driven by the authorities. They're saying, you've got to tell this story. You've got to tell um, uh, that story. This information is something that you have to uh, produce. But disclosure and engagement are entirely different things. And actually, I suggest that sometimes we've got almost too much disclosure. We've got information overload. Um, and for the ordinary shareholder, sifting their way through it to get to the one piece of information they really want is nigh on impossible. That can only come by being in an environment where they can actually ask questions. And so it is up to the company, if they, if they want to engage with, um, uh, with shareholders, to start to create that kind of environment. Who are the people inside the company that are most qualified in talking to, um, uh, uh, to shareholders and giving the ordinary shareholder a real feel of what's going on? It isn't the board. It's the, uh, it's the management. And on most issues that will, in, that will involve shareholders wondering about whether this is working, whether that is working, what new products are coming on, um, uh, on stream, what do you expect of these, what new services are you offering, what are your targets for this, even trying to explain what your strategies are, the qualified people to talk to shareholders are the, um, uh, are the, board of, uh, are the, are the management. Does this mean the board has no role? No. The board does have a role. It is up to the board to say, to determine the quality of disclosure and the means in which disclosure takes place. If you leave it to management, it will be, it will be analyst engagement and, uh, and, and so on. The occasional visit to the all-important EPF, the couple of big boys that are on the, um, uh, on the share register, fraught with danger, absolutely. And why is it that we see institutions moving ahead of the market? because these engagements end up with selective disclosure. The institutions know more about what's going on in, in the company than the regular shareholder. It's even worse when the institution happens to be in the majority. If Kazana owns the majority and it's a public company, do you think Kazana doesn't know things that the rest of the market, doesn't, the, 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 uh, rest of the market is oblivious to? Of course, Kazana has inside information. Wherever there is a major um, uh, institutional shareholder, they are sucking information out of the board, they're sucking information out of management, and it is simply by the weight of the fact that they are there and our Malaysian attitude of relative obedience. Actually, someone did a survey. We are, we are classified as one of the most obedient societies in the world. Yeah? We respond to authority by saying, yes, sir, what can I give you, sir? And if it's information, we pass it over not worrying about the consequences, not worrying about the ordinary shareholder that doesn't necessarily have it. So to, to regulate this, it is up to a board to set um, uh, uh, a schedule, working with management and the IR officer, who is after all part of management, to set a schedule for engagement with, um, uh, with shareholders, to say we wish to communicate in this kind of way, and we wish these kinds of positive engagements to take place, and then ask for reports on those engagements. Where, where should the board talk to um, uh, uh, shareholders? Primarily, I think, in two issues, if we, want to, if we want to target things quickly. First of all is in issues of corporate governance, and the second one will be in issues of executive remuneration, which seems to bother a lot of people these, um, uh, these days. In America, they are encouraging boards, uh, uh, boards to allow AGM agendas to include uh, resolutions which are non-binding on vote, but allow um, our shareholders to express an opinion on, um, on particularly on uh, remuneration matters. It, it is extremely difficult for, um, uh, for a company to ignore even a non-binding resolution. Um, and uh, uh, people that have attempted to do so have paid, uh, uh, have paid a price in terms, of, uh, in terms of their market value. I'm very worried, however, about the, the controlling institutional or the controlling major shareholder. And this concerns me because they have 
a really complicated um, uh, uh, relationship with the company. In many ways, they're involved in management. They certainly are, uh, they're certainly in a position where they appoint management. But if you look at them purely in their role as a shareholder, given the way in which they control, they have nothing to do with the market value of the company. Not as a shareholder. As management, maybe, but not as a shareholder. So who determines the market value of the company amongst the shareholders? It's the minority. The big institution isn't there because he's trading the shares, he's there because he's holding them. It's the minority that says whether the company is worth anything or not because they're the ones that are buying and selling on a daily basis. And so we have, a, we have another subset of a relationship here which is that between the majority and the minority. And the job of shareholder communication has got to be non-discriminatory. It's got to be one where all of the information is being made available to, um, uh, to all of the shareholders. You can't force every shareholder to turn up. But if you have engagements which are restricted only to analysts and only to institutions, you're not, making, um, uh, you're not creating a level playing field. The level playing field means opening the field. It doesn't mean uh, having people turn up. So investor days, the sort of thing that Jamal was, um, uh, was talking about, become vitally important in the way in which uh, uh, shareholder communications are, are managed. Um, am I an advocate for listening all the time only to the minority? No. There's something called the tyranny of a minority. And, um, uh, and it became extremely dangerous in the United States where you were getting 16-hour AGMs because of proxy votes and, um, and all the rest of it. And in the end, as everyone knows, you can't run a country and you can't run a company by referendum. It's, um, uh, uh, it's impossible. So I, I think these are some of the issues that, um, uh, that need to uh, uh, be grappled with. In looking at, at what I think is, um, is, is a key thing here is that shareholder engagement is not a panacea for success. Shareholder engagement is a means of sustaining su support from the community of owners for the company. Um, uh, uh, for the company. It is extremely difficult to realize successfully, but you fail if you don't make um, an honest attempt to it. Is shareholder engagement and corporate governance related? Yes. But here's something that I'm beginning to get really worried about. More and more, I look at corporate governance and the diktats of the authorities and the codes that they're telling us to abide by, and I'm beginning to feel that corporate governance starts and ends with management it is influenced by the board, but the board is not the architect of corporate governance. It is a monitor of um, corporate governance, and the shareholders are the victims of its failure. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Um, I think your point on disclosures, actually, is, is really a very interesting one, and something that how we as in the in, in journalism have to grapple with all the time, particularly because why some groups of investors enjoy preferential treatment, actually. Uh, we are very often uh, tipped off about stories because a um, particular analyst or stockbroking company would issue a morning briefing to their clients saying that a meeting with management yesterday uh, offered this much of information. And that typically leads to you know, some activity with the shares. Our job, I think, is to try and quickly level that playing field, to disseminate that information quickly. And, and um, this thing about some groups getting preferential treatment, I think, is a real issue. And it's something that I think whenever we try and push for exclusives, we try and do it uh, on companies to try it. The reason why we do it is basically to make sure that there's a level playing field. Everyone is, gets the information and they can trade on it. You know, if, they, if it's going to be you know, something whether you're going to buy or sell stock. So I think that's important. The other thing I think that what David mentioned is fairly crucial is how these large shareholders and how they, they can dictate things. Um, it's something that we need to grapple with. Um, on that on that note, I would be, you know, happy if you could, we could get people from the floor 
to either offer some comments or questions for our panelists today. Rita is saying that primary stewardship is the board. Hmm. Now, I, I just want to get those statements reconciled. Eh? Okay. Um, is, it, is it okay? Yeah. The governor and the steward are not necessarily the same thing. Okay. Corporate governance is about how making the company work in an effective, ethical um, uh, manner. Okay. And while the board may set a tone and may set certain standards, they are not running um, uh, risk management. They are not running um, uh, uh, strategy. They are not running all the ethical decisions that need to be taken on a day-to-day -day basis about the way the company conducts its business. That is the role of, um, uh, of, of management. And so management is at the delivery end of corporate governance. It is also in many ways at the formulation end of corporate governance because it tells the board the way the systems need to work. What are the controls that need to be in place? What are the checks and balances? Here is something where the board will then intervene and say, oh, we're, we're satisfied with this or we are not satisfied with this. But they have an oversight role. Oversight is closer to stewardship than it is with the um, uh, delivery of the day-to-day um, uh, of, of -day, uh, result. So I, I don't think um, Rita and I are, are disagreeing. We're coming at it from a slightly different uh, uh, perspective. The thing with stewardship with, um, uh, with investors is that to be honest, if your money is with um, uh, an institutional investor like an EPF, they have a fiduciary duty to, um, uh, to look after your money for you. And for too long, many of the big pension funds globally, it's not, it's not a, a, a EPF is, is unique at all, many of the big pension funds basically invested and it was the investment managers and the senior people on the, um, uh, on the investment panels in the, uh, in the pension funds that made huge decisions with vast amounts of money. Yours was a little bit of it. But if a little bit of a very big thing goes wrong because the whole of the thing goes wrong, everyone suffers as a, um, uh, as a result. So across Europe, it wasn't, people say it's a UK stewardship code, in fact, it started first in Holland and it spread around, uh, and around Europe. The Europeans um, picked it up, uh, the Europeans developed it, the Brits picked it up, renamed it and claimed ownership rights. It's happened before. Wish they'd have thought thoroughly about that with Sulu. But the, um, uh, the, the situation is that if you are going to be responsible to your beneficiaries, you must then take a view of responsibility towards the way in which you employ their money. And that means you must set policies about, um, uh, about what you expect from companies that you invest in. It simply isn't good enough to chuck your money in there on a trading basis, particularly if you aim to be making long-term sustainable returns in order to pay a pension. Someone's contributing for 40 years to get a pension out of it. It isn't an overnight money um, uh, uh, game. And so what happened, and it was driven and, and best articulated in the, in the United Kingdom, and there was a major um, uh, pension, uh, pension management group called Hermes, um, they started to create proactive engagement with boards. They said, we don't like this, we don't like that. They told boards of directors. Then interestingly, what they did was that they then published their policies for investment, and then they published annual reports to their beneficiaries about how they'd applied their policy. And it had a fundamental change in many, many companies which were on the edge uh, in terms of corporate governance. They interfered with some mergers and acquisitions which were determined not to be in the best interests of all of the, um, uh, of the shareholders. They interfered in certain management practices. They had a very great effect. It turned out that because it was an engagement exercise, they would go and sit with boards of directors and senior management and say, this is what we would like to see happen. And oh, by the way, if we do pull our multi-billion dollar investment from your um, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, portfolio, your share price is going to plummet because people will want to know why we're selling. It's, about, it's a bit like saying Warren Buffett decides to sell XYZ Corporation. If Buffett don't like it, the rest of the world won't like it. You know how it goes, okay? So the threat of them pulling their uh, favor to the company became uh, very important. It, was, it worked out to be much better 
than the Cowper's approach, which was simply to have a hit list of bad boys. Because um, unless you were engaging and unless you were taking action based on that, the bad boys uh, were never forced to, um, uh, to change. That's what responsible stewardship is at, um, uh, in, in terms of, of, of an investor. And now if I use the word stewardship and I look at the role of a director looking at the behavior of management, you see where they, you, you see the, um, uh, uh, the difference there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can respond as well on that. Um, when I say um, board has the, you know, uh, it, it, it's uh, in terms of uh, stewardship, it is, it has leadership. It is, you know, the board has to lead, whereas the management implements. When you go on the agency principle uh, theory, you know, shareholders are supposed to be the principal and then agents of the principal is the board and the board will elect the management and, you know, appoint the management. So finally, they, you know, it lies with the board. The responsibility is on the board. So happened that in most of um, uh, our, or at least in, in, in this uh, culture in Malaysia and many of the other Asian culture, we have executive directors and also uh, shareholders directors. So, you know, you have that kind of element in the board, but then it's a balanced board. As long as it's balanced, each, uh, each director have their own responsibility, finally to the company, and their responsibility is to ensure that effective board so that the management can you know, can bring value to the shareholders. That is the principle of it. So, stating that, you know, uh, when, uh, you know, when David was talking about the management being, you know, uh, uh, responsible for corporate governance, I really don't agree on that. It's still the, the management who are on the board, that's why you are the executive director. You are on the board and you, it's a board responsibility as a whole. If the CEO, if it's in the board, it's his responsibility as well, including independent directors and chairman. They're all in the board. You know? So that's what I'm trying to say as the board takes that stewardship role. And okay, another thing is on, on as, as regards um, if the chairman agrees, I mean, um, on um, when, you know, the principle of uh, disclosure and insider's information and etc. I think, um, yeah, very important. You have to have, when you do engagements, you, you know, uh, especially um, very big, strong shareholders, they have one-to-one -one or, you know, a group of investors going to companies and so on. As long as the board understands the principle of insider information and brings about and tells the, uh, you know, the... the uh, uh, the shareholders that this I, I'm bound by insider information and I can only disclose to you, uh, you know, um, uh, non-material information. If I do that, has not been uh, brought up in the open, you know. So therefore, there is an understanding about this engagement, and the engagement is to ensure that you understand the operations of the company. You bring about issues, like shareholders will bring up issues to the company, like, okay, I'm not very happy with your pay packages, or I'm not very happy with the dividend that you've given, or how do you think that, you know, this company could, you know, strategize such, you know, it could... Uh, uh, take opportunity overseas, uh, you know, opportunities and so on. These are things that they talk about. I don't think they talk about material, because I was, I must say, I'd like to correct some of this information that, you know, David, you've been, I was in the EPF, I must say, and I have engaged with some of the companies. When we do, we do it in a group, and we bring out, and uh, when we do say, we say that we do not want any material information. We, we bring it up to the companies. So they will talk about it and they'll say, okay, if there is any material information, they will bring it up at the, uh, or, or announce it in the, uh, for the rest of the uh, shareholders or put it in the website. So therefore, it is disclosed. So, um, you know, maybe it's going towards that level and I do not know which uh, shareholder you're talking about because... Um, uh, I, I would like to just put in, in you know, to, to ensure that 
at least when I was there, I know that it did not happen. It could have happened in other areas, like you know, um, communication, informal communications, and so on. Of course, these are insider information that occurs. I do not know. Uh, I do not want to say that it's a, as a institution over, you know, an institution investors going for engagements to companies that you know you get material information and you you use this information to buy and sell stocks. Many of these companies, you know, when EPF buys, it falls. What I'm trying to say is, it's not necessarily it rises. So uh, really, it is something that. Uh, um, you know, I was quite uncomfortable when you stated that because really it did not happen. Thank you. Um, Rita, uh, if, if you felt that I was singling out EPF for, um, uh, for criticism, um, you being oversensitive, I wasn't. Okay, in I'm fact, sorry. I, fact, I was just... Uh, no, it's, you know, it's fine. Yeah. In fact, EPF probably is one of the more ethical. However, we do have major shareholders here who will sit on the 30th floor or whatever it is uh, whose representative is also the chairman of the, um, uh, the listed company, which through the family or some trust or something else, they control. And when, a chairman, uh, when the uh, chairman who sits on the 30th floor calls the managing director upstairs and asks for information, that information is given. There is no okay, thought about enough. withholding it. Yeah? Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know where you're from. Can you uh, oh, okay. I, I, I identify yourself? No, I'm, I'm, I'm Rosman from Bank Rakyat. Huh? From Bank Rakyat. Bank pilihan anda. <laughs> the choice bank. <laughs> now, I tend to agree with David. Ultimately, corporate governance, management has to do it. Because the reality is the board... Implementing, okay, implementing. Uh, even taking the leadership role. Because at the end of the day, the board doesn't know a lot of things. Bear in mind, Too board... Bad, the board... Board only meets what? I don't know, some eight times a year, six times a year, depending, you know, depending on the organization. And I mean, being on the management side, I've also been on the board side. I tell you, there are many ways we can get through the board. Yeah. We know how to, 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 to do it, you know? Now, the board doesn't, I mean, I'm not saying that the board doesn't know, but there are many details the board doesn't know. So we, we can play a role in kind of, you know, bring board to a certain angle and they will make decision because we're good at that. That's why we're the management. Okay, I agree with you. But, you know, finally when a suit comes, a suit, okay, comes a legal suit, who is responsible? You tell me. Tell me. Board, right? So I'm talking about finally the responsibility lies with the board. Don't talk to me about management. Management can be the implementers. Too bad the board is not able to take hold of management. Reality is different, of course. If reality, if your board is, you know, many boards are in those earlier, yes. But it has to evolve la, towards a, a more responsible kind of, you know, where you are uh, responsible and you're accountable. And you're going to be, you know, Accountable, what I'm trying to say, if you, as a board independent director or executive, you do not take hold of your own company. Sorry lah. Well, you um, better... Yeah, I think yeah. getting, no, um, to, to, uh, to, be, to play the devil's advocate here, I mean, let's take Simon Darby for the example. Mm. You know, the board was criticized for a lot of, uh, for a lot of missteps, but it was the executive that actually was sued. So it's certainly not the case, I think, that it is the board, not always the board. But, so, but this happens even for very large companies. So I didn't see any member of the board resign immediately as a result of any of the missteps. So I think I can see where both sides are coming from, but I think in reality, uh, it has been the case. Okay, I, can I, can I, I, I totally agree. Uh, a good example is the Mokondo disaster. I don't know if you... I'm sure it's very visible, right? The, the rig that was... Um, in the Gulf Coast of Mexico, uh, where that blew up and killed 11 people and now caused you know, untold damage to the environment, whereby the CEO had to resign. Right? Uh, yes, he was on the board, but, uh, and the chairman, I think, uh, chose to also resign, but the current ongoing lawsuit is not to the board. And you might read all the time, it's BP, BP, BP. Actually, they're going after individual management teams, including 
the HSC manager who, was, who visited the rig less than 24 hours before it happened. Right. Okay. So, and, and me. to me, to me, that's corporate governance a little bit because, you know, if you if you remember, uh, that uh, it's not always about cheating money, but it sometimes is about what you do as as a corporation. And I, I'm not singling out BP; is my big customer. Uh, uh, we we could have been doing the same thing. Yes, we have customers. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Zarif. I'm from Shell, so I understand your point fully, and I'm alluding to your point. Um, I'm not going to argue who's responsible, whether the board or the shareholders, but from my perspective, I come from the legal division. From my perspective, it's corporate governance is not about the board, it's not about the management, it's about a collective effort. In terms of corporate governance, when you talk about control frameworks, the ones implementing it are the ones on the ground. If you have a solid grounding in terms of your government relations, in terms of your legal counsels, your risk management team, everyone follows the control procedure, and implements corporate governance from the very grassroots levels, then I think it goes upwards, not only downwards. And if you have those control frameworks followed by your employees, the management will do the right thing, and the board will be advised by the management and also expertise, the experts in the area. And ultimately, corporate governance can be implemented. Um, the argument on who's going to be sued or otherwise is, is really relative. Um, normal individuals, employees, can also be sued if they don't follow good corporate governance. So you can be the board, you can be the management, you can be a normal employee, and you can still be sued. So that's my opinion, my like two cents. So, Thank yeah. you very much. So good therefore, point. it's a shared responsibility. You know, when I mentioned earlier, it's every element, every, uh, uh, every aspect of the you know, corporate governance in the ecosystem, uh, every, like, um, mm, you know, all the partners of the corporate governance in terms of their management, the board and the shareholders, they have their role to play. And of course, the fiduciary responsibility is on the board. And of course, management have to, and you, you, know, you can extricate yourself if you say that in you know, the board can extricate them for many reasons. I would not want to bring up issues like that at the moment because I believe and I agree with what you were stating that, you know, every uh, uh, part of this uh, corporate uh, uh, role player has got a function. Things, things are getting a bit lively now. So, any more questions? Or any comments, actually? One thing I'd like, I'd like to add is actually, uh, as reporters sometimes, we get, you know, when not, not, not really tension, but differences between the board and management. We, I've, it's happened to me a couple, several times where you get information leaked to you by a particular member of the board. And mainly to flush out from management what really is happening, you know. So I think, I think uh, those are interesting times because, you know, then you really get into, into a story, you, you understand what is, or you, you're privy to what's happening. And then you see the, the, how boards and management interact. And I think that's when independent directors can actually play a very strong role. You know, I'd like to, you know, just probably independent directors here that, you know, journalists are always open to being leaked information like this so we can put management on, on their toes, actually. <laughs> uh, any questions? So that's an inter interesting comment because you're, you're right. Uh, uh, occasionally, to keep, to keep uh, in touch with things, I, I, I Google and troll you know, what I think retail investors are talking about a particular company. And then uh, from there, you know, when you Google, you get millions of links, right? And what's interesting is that in the past, people used to tell me, you know, Jamal, don't believe everything you read on the internet. But I tell you, this is changing. This is changing extremely fast, mainly because investors are much smarter now. This is th those days where, you know, they don't know anything is gone. And, uh, and uh, they have colleagues, they have friends inside big companies like, uh, you know, the bigger the company is, the more they know. So, uh, if you cannot find uh, <laughs> a journalist, I, I can tell you, 
go online and you, you can, your voice will be heard because uh, some major shareholders or investors, they also research online, right? Okay. Um, we're coming close to our time, five to wrap things up. Uh, we can take maybe one more question before we, we call it a day for the first day of this two-day conference. <laughs> Would you like to make any closing comments, David? Um, I, if we're going to, if we're going to uh, create a better um, environment, a more communicative environment between shareholders and the companies in which they invest, and that tripartite um, uh, role is is to become functional. It's predicated on one thing and really one thing only, and it is a willingness to disclose and share information, and a willingness to listen to response. Um, very often, companies believe that simply pumping out information is the um, uh, is the answer. Institutional stewardship forces p uh, companies to um, uh, to listen. They must also be, however, willing to listen to what minority shareholders um, uh, have to say. It can have a very important effect on, um, uh, on the future value of the, uh, of the company. But it starts with this willingness to engage in two-way communications, not just one way. Uh, Rita, would you like to make some closing comments? Yeah. Um in terms of engagement, I just want to uh, state that you know that is the first. Normally, you have a dialogue with the companies. You will, uh, you know, you you bring up issues on a, you know uh, engagement on a, in a closed door engagement. If that fails normally, you go ex you escalate it upwards to, you know, sometimes uh, writing articles or even at the AGMs. So if Companies can, you know, can resolve issues uh, with the shareholders, you know, in a, you know, in a, in a very uh, amicable manner in a closed door. That would be the first, uh, uh, I would say, uh, way of engaging, and it brings a lot of rapport and a lot of uh, goodwill amongst both the shareholders and the uh, company directors uh, about their companies. And during turbulent times, these are the times when you require the support. If the um, uh, company has uh, you know, provided information with candor with, uh, and transparent with them, uh, uh, with the shareholders. So I believe that engagement is a very important uh, process that you have to go through. And um, in addition, I just want to also state here, uh, CG is a, you know, is, is a shared responsibility in the corporate governance ecosystem. All of the, as, as uh, uh, David has stated, is a tripartite uh, responsibility. And if everyone plays their role, it, is, you know, it gives much, much uh, value to the companies as well as the whole capital market. It, it brings about, you know, it, it attracts funds because they know the, the minority shareholders are normally the institutional investors overseas and, of course, uh, some local investors. They will come because they know that investors are protected in terms of uh, their rights and their obligations, and, and companies are uh, transparent in their dealings. Uh, and, of course, over, um, the, I, I just want to bring up this information overload was one thing that... Um, that Barry and you know, I think the chair has stated. Uh, this is occurring. Sometimes when you see the corporate proposals are so thick and it is really meaningless for retail investors to understand what the issues are, it becomes an issue. So these are the things that probably the, the, the companies must know that it has to be, and they, they have to ensure that the, um, the information is made so simple, understandable, and that's about corporate governance. Corporate governance is about transparency, and transparency is not disclosure alone. It is about quality disclosure. So I just want to state that because 
Otherwise, you need to engage with everyone all the time. You know, uh, so if you, your information is very simple and easily understandable, you, you don't even need the first step of engagement. Of course, that will be on corporate proposals and you know, uh, other issues. Thank you. Uh, Chai Jawa? Don't, uh, I think uh, the only thing I want to share with everyone is that don't always think that just because you're an owner or shareholder of a public listed company that you have to be responsible and engage the management. I think uh, we all know in this room that sometime, sometimes uh, a public listed company can suddenly become private and uh, sometimes a private company can take over public listed companies, right? So be engaged from, from every angle and every day. Thank you. Okay. I think that brings us to our end of this session. I'm, on a final note, I'd like to say that I think clearly corporate governance is something that's collective. And the more uh, minority activism, whether it's from institutional investors or whatever, uh, will only make the environment better. Greater activism will make the environment better. And especially, you know, in, in, in environments where we, we are in, sometimes Activism will help us also because sometimes the guards need guarding, you know. So greater activism will help towards that end. And with that, thank you very much for uh, uh, listening to us and coming today. Wishing you guys uh, another fruitful session to make tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, our fear panelists on stage, for those very uh, constructive and informative thought sharing of uh, advocating constructive shareholder engagement for long term value maximization. So now we would like to invite Mr. Lopez to present a token of appreciation to Ms. Rita Benoit Bushan. And now, Ms. Julie, on behalf of Asian Summit, will present the token to Mr. Leslie.